Right, let's um, have a look at this electrolytes practical. So let's just check we've got, yeah, and you can see it in Excel. But I'm not going to cover the exact answers or um, show you any sample data. I'm just going to show the method here because you might want to generalize it at some point. So we've got, as we add in this reactant, uh, the conductivity decreases steadily. And then it reaches an endpoint, and the reaction changes slightly, and suddenly the uh, uh, the conductivity begins increasing again. And this is a little bit like at hydration, where there's an endpoint here where everything is equal. And we want to figure out where's that point because it's clearly not at four, and it's clearly not at five. It's somewhere in between, and we could maybe eyeball it as four and a quarter. But how do we get that precise, and how accurate do we need that? So let's uh, do that all. Kind of from scratch so what i'm going to do is right click and add a trend line in excel here and show the, the equation and the r squared and all of that uh, now i'm going to get rid of these grid lines because they'll get in the way uh, so we've got this trend line going through them but that's not the trend line we want it's actually it's linear coming down here so we need to exclude some of the data now I've probably shown a few people how to do this before, but if you want to really quickly add a second data point or a second data series, highlight the whole graph in Excel, and then you see this purple and blue box on the left, click the tag in the bottom and drag it to a new column. That adds a second data series uh, automatically. If you right click and go to select data, you see that there's a series one and series two. And what we need to do is drag some of those data points onto the other series. And you can just highlight them all and then drag across. And if there's some ambiguity about which is on what series, you can drag it back and forward and see what looks best or perhaps even delete them. You could delete the ones closest to your endpoint if they're ambiguous. And certainly with real data, you can run into that sometimes. But I'm just gonna leave them like this for now. I'm also going to add in a trend line on this side add my r squared and equation now i've got two uh simultaneous equations you see and i want to find out what uh is here where do these two cross where are they equal uh, and so for that i'm going to do a little bit of work uh, by hand just to show you where this comes from so you can actually take those two equations type them into all from alpha and uh, it will actually solve simultaneous equations for you automatically uh, you just have to type them in uh, so but instead I'm going to show you how to do this uh, by hand so we've got two equations we have a y equals let's say m x plus c we've got two equations like that so I'm just going to label them m1 and c1 and I've actually got a second equation like that as well. Y equals M2 plus C2. So those are two best fit lines we've got here. And how do we equate these together? Well, we just set them equal to each other. We know that this X is the same in the crossing point. We know this Y is the same in the crossing point. So we actually just take this and make it equal to that. Uh, the Y doesn't really come into it or at least we can get rid of it and then type that out separately again keeping some kind of color involved and actually I'll tell you what I've missed I've missed out the X So that's actually, this is one method of doing simultaneous equations. You can just set, if they're in this form, y equals something, y equals something. You just set the two y's to be equal to each other. And then you've got an equation with just the one variable. And we're then going to begin collecting like terms and working with some brackets and so on. So all of these m's here have an x associated with them. So I'm going to put those on the same side. Make them m1 x, bring this over, it becomes minus m2 x and that's going to be equal to c2 and i'll bring this side over to become minus c1 
Okay, so pretty straightforward so far. We'll rearrange our stuff. Next, I'm going to pull this x out of the bracket because uh, that's what we want to calculate. So if we bring that all out, we have x and m1 minus m2. And for completion's sake, I'll write c2 minus c1 here. Great, that's that's fine so far. Uh, now we just want to keep x on one side. We do x, and well, we've got to bring this whole thing across. So we're not comfortable with the algebra at this point. This is now like one object that we can ignore. C2 minus C1 M1 minus M2. Now it doesn't matter which one's M1 and which one's M2. It doesn't matter. Uh, we've got two sets of numbers as long as we're consistent and we remember which way around they go. So if we have this from one equation and that from the other, we can't swap them around at the bottom, it won't work. So now I've got this here, we can return back to our spreadsheet uh, and have a look at what we've got. In fact, I'm going to get the data out of this first. Um, I'm going to type in equals line st of the known y's, the known x values, true, true. If you're working on the newer versions of Excel, you don't need to do the control shift enter. It will do something called a spill and automatically fill in everything uh, for you, line ST. So that's our first one. First line, well, I guess it's identical to what I've taught before. And the second line, line ST, known wise, here, known X is true, true. And the reason I've done this is because we're later we're going to go on to um, how to propagate the error as well. So just make myself some space. Uh, and x, the crossing point, is going to be equal to c1, uh, sorry, c2, minus uh, c1. And in fact, I'm going to bracket that off divide that by m1 minus m2. They've got to be swapped the other way around. And this comes out to 4.38, uh, which is roughly where we expected it to be. If we uh, if we do a line down here, kind of draw that in straight down there. Oops. I've just crashed over the It's around there. It's about four and a half, so it works. Now, if you type that straight into Open Alpha, it will give you that number exactly as well. So now we're going to go on to part two of this. We're going to ask, uh, what's the propagation of error for this? And for this, we are going to uh, break this formula down into a couple of pieces. I've written this derivation on the Canvas question, but I'll go into it it's anyway. So. This is a quotient. It's one thing divided by another, which is you know, the same as a multiplication. So if what we're going to do is write this down as a new variable, and I just tend to write just delta C, because delta in uppercase there means a difference, and then delta M. This is the difference there. And in principle, it doesn't really matter which way we get them around now for this, for the errors, but it will um, for the actual value. So in a quotient, the uncertainty in x here divided by x, so it's a relative error, is equal to the square root of two things squared added to each other. And it's specifically uh, the uncertainty in delta c oops, divided by delta c itself. That's a, a little bit square up here isn't it there's a lot of numbers to fit in but the same thing there the uncertainty in the value divided by the value itself so this is like a relative error you could call that anything else but we want that 
But how do we get the error in the mix? Well, it comes from these two things being added today, right? If we want to get the error in this, we need to do another propagation of errors. So the uncertainty, you can see delta C there. Well, that's an addition thing there. It's slightly different. We don't put the relative errors here. We put the absolute errors in. So that's just going to be the uncertainty in C1 squared and the uncertainty C2 squared. And may as well write it out for the other one as well. So the uncertainty in this number here, call it whatever you like. Again, is equal to the square root two other uncertainties added together, right? Now, this is the uncertainty that we want, but these are the numbers that we actually have already, because these are the ones in Excel that we've got from that line stats element. So let's have a look at that now. Let's see. So these are our, insert, our gradients and slopes then the numbers just underneath are those standard errors. So I'm going to set underneath this X here, uh, actually what I was thinking about. So I'm going to look at building in these uh, different values. So all I need is that difference in the two intercepts. I'm just going to call that delta C because I can't be bothered to put in the delta uh, sign. And that is C1, mm, oh sorry, C2, look at, the, look at my notes, C2 minus C1. One, so that is going to be that number minus that number minus fourteen. Now, what's the del m? It is going to be m one minus m two. Uh, so again, if we did that uh, divided by this, we get the same number as before. Right, four point three eight. That's our x value. Now we're going to talk about the uncertainty in each of those. So uncertainty in delta C. Well, that's our big propagation of errors thing. So if we do the sum uh, squares of the two Cs, which are the numbers underneath, that one and that one. And we also then need to square root it. That's the uncertainty in that top number done the sum squares of those two standard errors of the intercept and then square rooted it afterwards that's what the sum squares mean there and maybe we will do the same for m here now if we press ctrl d under there it will uh, duplicate the exact formula but i will need to move these to pick up the standard errors and slope instead so then that's uh, the, those two uncertainties now how do we then get the uncertainty in x. Well, I'm going to start with the uncertainty of x divided by x. That's the relative error. Uh, and that is, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to do a square root and sum squared, but the inputs here need to change. If we go back to the uh, our formulas here, we've got to have an error divided by the absolute number, the error divided by the absolute number to get the relative error. Don't do that. So let's go back to it. So the sum squared is the uncertainty in delta C divided by C itself, right? There we go. And the uncertainty in delta M divided by oops, the uncertainty in delta M that way around divided by the uncertainty or by the actual value of delta M itself. There we go. So that's actually a relative error now. It's a percentage. So we're actually within 7%. We want to get that back. Well, look at how the formula would be. We've got that divided by x. We need to multiply by x. So we take that times 4.3. We got 0 0.3. So whatever the uncertainty is in this crossing point, it's 0 0.3. As you can imagine, these numbers are not particularly good towards the end. So maybe if this was a bit higher, let's go back and we measure that point, for instance our error goes down because this is a bit more of a straight line the last squared has gone up to 0 0.997 uh, whereas previous it was 0.991 so that is the kind of the propagation of errors for this fractal it is a little bit involved it's quite a few things going on in it 
up and it basically let me just go back to here for a second uh this is kind of how you would go about building a propagation of errors through a more complicated formula because we rearrange something to get a formula for what we want right and if we know that we can actually start uh, putting propagation of error formulas together you can literally pipe these two into there because we've broken it up into smaller bits we don't want a quotient so we need a quotient but this values that go into the quotient comes from these linear additions which is this formula here so we need two versions of that they pipe into there and that's our uncertainty remembering that you know we at least have a rearrange and put that on the other side at least um to get the raw data value so with that that's hopefully the end of it uh Hopefully you got that right and this uh, helps you understand how to go about it.